back. Uh, as I, for those of you who might have just joined us, I'm Jacob Reynolds, an Associate Fellow of the Academy of Ideas, and I'm uh, kind of delighted to be chairing this very important uh, session that we'll be kicking off some of the panels after uh, lunch with, uh, which is in the wake of terror, uh, contemporary antisemitism. And I mean, this is one of those discussions that I don't need to spend very long uh, contextualizing. Uh, obviously, with the, um, with, with the eruption of war in Israel, uh, starting with Hamas's brutal attacks on, uh, on Israeli civilians, the, we, we witness the kind of speed to uh, events that is sometimes hard to get a, a grip on. The thing that might be striking for many people is that the, this was one of the kind of, at least one of the first conflicts I can remember where there was never even a moment of solidarity with the victims of Hamas's attacks and rather things moved immediately onto a concern about Palestine. I was reminded slightly of a, a quote that's been doing the rounds, a quip from uh, Norm MacDonald where he, 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 was, he said, um, uh, one of the things that frightens me most is if uh, ISIS were to detonate uh, a, bomb, a nuclear bomb in Manhattan and uh, kill six million Americans. Imagine the backlash on peaceful Muslims. Um, and so that, that sense of like misidentifying kind of quite what's going on and failing to get to grips with uh, really the nature of this. But in this discussion today, uh, at least I hope we'll start by focusing as much on what anti-Semitism means here in the UK and getting to grips with it here in the UK. We have seen, of course, uh, very substantial pro-Palestine marches which were branded by uh, certain politicians immediately these hate marches and for me disentangling the fact that sure there must and there are and we've seen examples of uh, nasty anti-semitism as part of those marches but at the same time that doesn't tar everybody who went on a march uh, with the same brush uh, and so disentangling people who would join a march out of a feeling of solidarity for uh, ordinary Palestinians versus uh, maybe the organizers and certainly significant parts of those on those marches who are anti-Semites and disentangling those difficult issues is something we may have to make a start on. This is not a debate, uh, Israel good or bad, but is an attempt to get to grips with the kind of extent and causes of contemporary anti-Semitism, how and if it's changed its character over recent years and decades, and perhaps most importantly, what we uh, all should do to confront it. To help us uh, kick off the discussion, we've got a really great panel. I'll introduce them in the order that they'll speak. So firstly, if you were here with us uh, in the first session, you'll recognize uh, Stephen, who's a reporter and podcaster, the host of the Night Tube. I hope after hearing him earlier today and then hearing him now, you'll, you'll be subscribing to his show and watching that uh, religiously. Um, so welcome back to Stephen. Next, we'll hear over on my right uh, from Ike Ajay, who's an author and an architect. He's the founder of the London uh, Architecture Walks. Uh, the founding signatory for Don't Divide Us. He's also really excellent value on Twitter for those of you who are on mm. Twitter. So I suggest you follow him for uh, often very funny um, and engaging takes on what's going on. We'll next hear from Leslie Claff, who's a senior lecturer in law, and, but for our discussion, very importantly, the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Contemporary Anti-Semitism, someone who that tells you has been thinking long and hard about what anti-Semitism means today in the here and now and how if uh, and why it might have changed or mutated or what we're really dealing with when we think of anti-Semitism. And then uh, on my immediate right, we've got Daniel ben who's a journalist. Uh, he's the creator of uh, Radicalism of Fools, which is a website, a substack, a, 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 well, a newsletter, sorry, uh, a campaign, uh, above all, an attempt to get to grips with uh, how anti-Semitism has been changing in recent years. Um, and I really suggest that you sign up to that, get involved with some of that work because it's really interesting to keep on top of. So uh, our panel will introduce us with short opening speeches. You'll be familiar with how things run if you're with us in the first session. Then, as ever, and as I said in my opening remarks uh, earlier this morning, it's over to you, over to us, to have a public discussion to kind of get to grips with what we're really talking about here and what we might uh, want to do about it. So without any further ado, hand over to Stephen. Thank you very much, and uh, thanks to the Battle of Ideas for, for having this discussion. Um, Anti-Semitism is always an important issue, uh, depressingly. Uh, it's become desperately important in these last uh, couple of months for obvious reasons. Uh, but anti-Semitism in itself is a very unique form of racism. Um, of course, with all racism, the main driver appears to be ignorance, and ignorance plays no small part uh, in anti-Semitism. But unlike other forms of racism, anti-Semitism is sometimes harder to spot. It can be less obvious. 
uh, and therefore often goes unchecked by people that otherwise claim to live and breathe anti-racism. Anti-Semitism can often be pseudo-intellectual, uh, wrapped up in conspiracy theory and historic revisionism. Anti-Semitic tropes are so plentiful and varied that some people don't even realize they are there even when they are the size of billboards. Uh, if we're going to be charitable, uh, this explains why someone like Jeremy Corbyn can look at a mural of a, a sort of hook-nosed, bearded man counting money and fail to see any problem at all. Or recently why Greta Thunberg didn't realize it wasn't wise to place a plush octopus toy in the background of her pro-Palestinian Instagram post. Uh, but unfortunately, it gets far more sinister than just mere cluelessness. Uh, this is a problem that has been bubbling under the surface in the UK and wider for years. And the truth is that the main source of anti-Semitism comes to us from Islamism. Uh, the mainstream response to October 7th massacres have seemingly given Islamists what they perceive to be the green light to flaunt their overt Jew hatred on our streets. It's now brazen, as some of the clips we're seeing calling for the death of Jews uh, on our social media feeds, including coming out of mosques uh, as well. Uh, so I just want to share a, a brief story. It's darkly humorous and very lowbrow, uh, but it perfectly mm. exemplifies the utter obsession and hatred of Jews that permeates the Islamist mind. Uh, you may recognize the name Mohammed Atta. He was one of the 9-11 hijackers. He was the ringleader, in fact. Uh, sometime before 9-11, he studied at Hamburg University, living in shared accommodation with uh, his fellow students. And one day, he was suffering from a rather nasty stomach complaint and had to rush to the loo to, re uh, to relieve himself. I, uh, I warned you it was lowbrow. <laughs> um, after some time, he emerged from the loo to find his fellow flatmates laughing hysterically at his ex expense. Uh, and to his embarrassment, he realized that his flatmates had heard every single explosive bodily noise coming from the other side of the bathroom door. And you know what the first thing uh, Mohammed Atta thought to do about this embarrassing situation? He angrily blamed the Jews for failing to make the bathroom door thick enough to dampen the sound of his bowels. Um, unfortunately, um, some fear that anti-Semitism isn't only a staple of the Islamist extremists within the Muslim community. Uh, as British journalist Mehdi Hassan wrote in 2013, and I quote, uh, it pains me to have to admit this, but anti-Semitism isn't just tolerated in some sections of the British Muslim community, it's routine and commonplace. He uh, then went on to describe it as our dirty uh, little secret. So I think British Jews have every right to feel afraid and abandoned by their fellow countrymen, countrymen rather, and institutions right now. Uh, after the massacre on uh, October the 7th, I imagine many British Jews turned on the news in the hope of finding some sense of balance and, and sanity. That's the first mistake. And, and what they found was the BBC refusing to refer to Hamas as terrorist, even though under UK law, Hamas are, are literally a prescribed terrorist organization. Uh, they also saw, see the BBC banning their employees from the march against anti-Semitism that's taking place in, in uh, London tomorrow. They saw Kay Burley on Sky News asking Israeli officials whether Israel's willingness to release more prisoners than it receives back in Israeli hostages somehow revealed how very little they believe Palestinian life to be worth. So we all live in a country that seems really willing to take a knee, wave a flag or light up monuments and stadiums uh, in solidarity with the victims of atrocities. Yet we suddenly decided that was no longer appropriate when the atrocity in question was the mass slaughter of innocent Jews. It is of course perfectly possible to have sympathy with the plight of the Palestinian people for reasons completely unrelated to anti-Semitism, but I do tend to wonder why people are so animated by this one particular skirmish that is taking place on the other side of the planet. If it's simply a matter of body count, then why do we, no see, why do we not see comparable protests in the name of Syria or, or Ukraine? Um, if it's to defend what's perceived to be persecuted Muslims, then why are there no comparable protests for the Uyghur Muslims in China who are currently experiencing um, the, the you know, extremes of ethnic cleansing? Or is it the idea that the only safe place for Jews in that whole region is somehow an extension of white Western supremacy? This is the same sort of silliness that can compel someone like uh, Diane Abbott to claim that Jews can't experience racism. If the protest in response to the Israeli-Gaza uh, conflict were truly about innocent lives and peace, why didn't we see placards and chants to bring home the hundreds of Israeli hostages, or the placards condemning the actions of Hamas too? In fact, the anti-Israeli protesters, many glorifying the Hamas attackers, <coughs> took to the streets before the charred remains of Israeli civilians had even began to cool down. 
So I'll finish by saying I, I hope these last several weeks have shocked people and provided a glimpse into the very thin line between social order and pogroms and how quickly a minority can be dangerously vilified. Uh, it is to our shame that Jews are once again uh, being made to feel unsafe in their own country. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, uh, Ike, some first thoughts from you. All right. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you to Bellow Ideas for um, hosting this, and thank you for hopefully listening to me for the next few minutes. Um, I, like most well-meaning people, I hope you can, everyone can hear me, was horrified by what happened on October 7th. There was no equivocation for me. It was an awful lapse of humanity. It was a terrible event to happen. But in many ways, what's horrified me more and what's exhausted me more, to be honest, has been the reaction and what's happened afterwards, things I never thought would, I, I'd see. We've seen the marches, obviously, which have been pointed out. You don't, you're, not everybody on those marches is, is an anti-Semite, but we've seen racial hatred bloom on those marches, and we've seen um, elements I never thought I'd see in the streets of my city, London, um, in my lifetime. We've seen the police choosing which laws to implement and which laws not to implement and a kind of in, in creating a pattern of inconsistency which just opens the floodgates to extremism. Um, we've seen the BBC, has been mentioned before, refusing to call Hamas terrorists and trying to make us all think that every Middle East hospital has Kalashnikovs in it as a matter of normality. Um, we've seen the FA not re refusing to light up Wembley, even though they were happy to light up for things worthy issues like Breast Cancer Awareness Week, um, for the um, awful attacks in um, Paris. They refused to light up their stadium for the Israel attacks. And we've even also seen the Secretary General of the United Nations say that October 7th didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, would he dare say that the Holocaust didn't happen in a vacuum, or apartheid didn't happen in a vacuum, or even the Manchester Arena bombings here, or the 77 bombings in London didn't happen in a vacuum? So there's this pattern of um, uh, inconsistency, pattern of hostility that we've seen since the attacks, which, as I say, has horrified me and really exhausted me as much as the attacks themselves. Now, I'm not saying all of that is driven by anti-Semitism, but I think it's undeniable that there's a kind of, there's an underbelly of anti-Semitism that's underpinning a lot of this reaction. How do we know that? Well, we know that because in London, there were two Jewish schools that were closed in October because Jewish school children, British children, school children, little children with nothing to do with any of this, could not go to school. A basic social function they weren't able to do. We know anti-Semitism is involved because synagogues in London, a synagogue in London a couple of weeks ago in St. John's Wood, part of London where I have a friend who lives, <coughs> worshippers were attacked with fireworks as they left the synagogue. We have um, we have posters of missing children which are being ripped down um, in various places because essentially the children are Israeli or they're Jewish. Why do we know anti-Semitism involved, is involved in the reaction to October 7th? Because these things are happening and the link is very clear as far as I'm concerned. Um, of course, as I say, it doesn't mean that everybody who has an issue with Israeli foreign policy or um, sympathizes with the plight of Palestinians, which I'm more than willing to do, um, um, is doing it from an anti-Semitic perspective. But we do ourselves as a society no justice if we ignore the fact that there is a clear pattern of hate and hostility to a particular group that's underpinning a lot of these things that are happening. Now, why is this happening? Why is it happening? Why can't we just universally condemn terrorism um, after what happened on October 7th? Um, there are far more kind of learned specialist minds than me on this panel to answer this question. But these are just three quick reasons why I think we've seen this rise in anti-Semitism. I think the prob one of the problems, the first reason I think, is the West itself. I always say the West's biggest problem isn't Islam, it's itself. We have lost confidence in ourselves as a Western community. We don't believe in our values anymore. We're obsessed with decolonization, apologizing, <coughs> excuse me, apologizing for things that happened hundreds of years ago. We're experiencing a moral collapse which makes it easier to equivocate and excuse the most appalling instances of evil. 
Evil as well, I think. We as, a, we as a culture, as a society, we don't really kind of accept evil anymore or look at it as something that's tangible. Obviously, they did in medieval ages and far more restrictive times than ours, but we don't really compute evil. The first time I saw this was um, after September 11th. There was a, um, an opinion piece I read, and I, I, I naively assumed that everybody would blame the terrorists for September 11th. But this opinion piece said, oh, it's actually the fault of um, American foreign policy, it's American cultural imperialism, Fair enough, you can look at those things as contributory factors, but the reason September 11th happened is because people decided to fly planes into buildings. We do not understand evil anymore, and when we don't understand evil, because, I mean, evil's a terrifying thing to understand. I, I don't want to believe that there's anybody who has the capacity to in inflict the harm and the horror we saw on October 7th. So what do we do as human beings? We shy away from that, and we say, oh, evil doesn't really exist, it's too terrifying to contemplate, so let's look at reasons instead, foreign policy, cultural imperialism, decolonization, etc. But as a Western community, because of our moral collapse, we don't accept what evil is anymore, which is, I think makes it easier to excuse. The second element, why I think, um, reason why I think anti-Semitism has grown, has risen, is because of identity politics, the scourge that's overtaken the West in the past two decades, where everything is defined by our identities. We're segregated into silos of race or color or religion, and that's supposed to kind of um, determine our reaction to everything. And if you look at, um, m most of identity politics is done in a kind of, what I like to call an oppression odometer, whereby you have a kind of a scaled, um, scaled a scale of oppression or persecution with very often it's um, black people right at the bottom. We're continually impressed no matter, no matter what we do or achieve or experience. And at the top would be, I imagine, rich alpha white males, such as you have many living in Israel and comp composing the Israeli government as well. So because and in our, in our moral collapse and in our kind of cultural naivety, we try and force feed all our cultural problems into this identity politics prism. It makes it easier to look at Israelis, to look at white men, and we cannot possibly sympathize with them because they're the oppressor. And if they're the oppressor, it makes it easier to kind of impose hate and hostility and racism onto them. And the third... Yes, yeah, just very, very briefly. The third and probably most controversial reason I think we're seeing these kind of things as well is to a degree because of multiculturalism as well. Now, when I say that, look, I'm a product, uh, my parents were Nigerian um, immigrants in this country, I, and I get the idea and I support the idea of a multi-ethnic society. But there's nothing wrong in us all being invited to integrate and coalesce under one umbrella, one culture of Britishness. There has to be more to being to British culture than being a receptacle for every other culture. And when you have silos of segregation whereby people are allowed to do what they like, essentially, it makes it easier for tension and anti-Semitism to bloom in between them. So, um, yeah, there's a little more to say. No, yeah, we'll pick up the Thank rest of the discussion. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very much to thank Battle you. of Ideas for inviting me and welcome to the audience. Um, so um, in terms of anti-Semitism today, after the October the 7th uh, pogrom, I think what we're seeing is eliminationist anti-Zionism. Um, and the cause is not to establish a Palestinian state or to criticize Israeli policy, but to dismantle Israel. Now, those who support this cause see Israel as the product and tool of Western imperialism. This has already been alluded to by my two co-speakers. Um, as a settler colony uh, with no legitimacy. And if Israel is seen as a settler colony, then Israelis are seen as colonizers. Um, they're seen as white, racist, oppressor colonizers. And as such, their fundamental human rights are negated. And it's very interesting that Israelis and Jews as well are seen as white racist colonizers. Um, and this is a tradition in anti Semitism whereby Jews have been abstracted uh, to depict whatever demon is facing society at any particular time. So, for example, uh, Christianity originally, Christianity labeled Jews Christ killers. Um, and then at the, in the 11th, uh, 12th century, they were called child murderers, the blood libel. During the Black Death, they were accused of spreading the Black Death by means of 
poisoning wells and Jews were labeled as well poisoners. Uh, Nazi anti-Semitism uh, referred to Jews as our misfortune. Uh, and so now Jews are seen as colonizers and they've been dehumanized as colonizers uh, in the same way that they've been de dehumanized as other things in the past. And this is why supporters of Palestine um, were able, you know, to the, why they responded to the Hamas uh, pogrom of October the 7th, the brutal uh, murder and, and kidnapping and so on and slaughter uh, in three particular ways. So first of all, there was denial. Secondly, there was, um, well, first, actually, there was celebration. Secondly, there was denial. And third, there was justification. So in terms of the celebration, again, I think J James is, James, right? Stephen, <laughs> Stephen sorry, Stephen has alluded to this. Um, the very next day, on October the 8th, before Israel had taken any action at all in Gaza, there were marches, uh, you know, through cities in, in England, including Manchester, where I was born and raised, uh, celebrating yeah. what happened. There were people carrying banners saying glory to the freedom fighters. Uh, Manchester supports the Palestinian resistance because the view of Israel as a settler colonial state, which is legitimate, uh, which is illegitimate, mm. means that any act of terrorism is an act of resistance. So they see terrorism as Palestinian resistance. Um, in terms of denial, um, we've seen people tearing down pictures of hostages. Uh, that's an example of denial. Some people have said they just don't believe that anybody was kidnapped. Um, we've seen Israel had to invite foreign journalists to a very macabre screening in Tel Aviv of Hamas's own uh, cell film footage of their own terrorist atrocities. Uh, which they'd live, live streamed, live streamed uh, on their own social media channels. And people still continue to deny what happened. We had three uh, websites, Mondo Vice, which is given a lot of credibility by the left in this country, uh, the Electronic Intifada and Jewish Voice for Labour, uh, all uh, published an article which suggested that October the 7th was carried out by the IDF in order to justify uh, the war on Gaza. Um, we've had implicit denial where people have condemned Israel for committing what they refer to as a genocide on Gaza uh, without mentioning what happened on October the 7th, without mentioning the hostages. We saw there was a letter, uh, Artists for Palestine, uh, circulated an open letter signed by 4,000 people, including Tilda Swinton, Alexei Sale, Steve Coogan, and so on. Uh, and then justification. This is We've seen this a lot in academia, in universities around the country, where people have uh, signed open letters um, which recognize that what Hamas did was a problem, but justify it on the grounds of Israel's brutal oppression uh, what they call brutal oppression against the Palestinians or ongoing settler colonialism. Um, so although not all the protesters on the marches are anti-Semitic anti or support Hamas, um, eliminationist anti-Zionism uh, is the political project on the ground that they are lining up behind. Uh, whether they know it or not, uh, and whether they like it or not. Do I have a few more minutes? Yeah, uh, 30 seconds or so. Oh, okay. Well, I'll, I'll, fi I'll finish there. I'll finish okay, there, correct. and then we'll make some other points later. All right, Great, okay. thanks a lot. And Daniel. Okay, I'm not going to give a big tub-thumping speech about how bad anti-Semitism is, because I'm assuming, certainly hoping, that everyone here is against anti-Semitism. And wherever you stand in relation to Israel and the Palestinians, uh, you can have different views on that. But I'm assuming people here are against anti-Semitism. Uh, what I want to do really is to pick up on a point that Ike made in relation to identity politics and how that relates to anti-Semitism. Because I think that's probably the least understood aspect of this whole discussion. And here I slightly disagree with Stephen. It's not an absolute disagreement, because I agree with you that Islamism is a factor although there's a big discussion to be had about what exactly does Islamism mean as opposed to Islam. Mm. 
uh, which we haven't got time to go into now. Uh, but I don't think it's the main factor. I think that the key factor, and the fact that people don't recognise, is identity politics. So in other words, there are certain things happening in Gaza and southern Israel, and we can discuss those. Uh, but, but when there's a discussion about what's happened there in Britain, it's informed by the particular ideas and preconceptions we have in Britain. Uh, and I would argue that the reason you've had a significant increase in overt anti-Semitism in relation to those events in the Middle East is because of ideas that are catching hold in Britain. So like my fellow panellists, I don't believe most Brits are anti-Semitic. I don't even believe that uh, everyone on the anti-Israel march is, is anti-Semitic either. A lot of people go just because they feel sympathy for the Palestinians, which is, which is fine. But I do think that uh, if your starting point is identity politics then you're very much predisposed to drawing anti-Semitic conclusions. And what do I mean by identity politics? Also a kind of big topic which I began to talk about. But if you think that the most important thing about people is not them as individuals, or it's not how we as a human species can go about improving things, the single most important thing about people is the identity group that they belong to. It could be Jewish, Muslim, black, white, gay, straight, whatever but the most important thing is the identity group. And then you take the view that there's this kind of hierarchy of identities uh, with white people being privileged at the top, which again I would say is a kind of another assumption of, anti, uh, of uh, identity politics. It's quite easy to draw the conclusion, or many people draw the conclusion, uh, who accept those premises, that uh, Jews are hyper-beneficiaries of white privilege. So in other words, in the past, people would have seen the Jewish community and said, OK, generally speaking, it's fairly affluent, it's fairly successful. And in the past, people might have said, yeah, that's, that's a good thing. That, that's, that's an example of uh, aspiration. You know, the Jews came here maybe 100 years ago, some more recently, some further back, uh, and they've integrated in, into British society and they've been successful, and that's a good thing. But from the perspective of identity politics, the only way they could do that is at the expense of others and at the expense of people of colour. <clears throat> so once you accept the premise of identity politics, it's very easy to draw the conclusions, conclusion that Jews are the kind of hyper-beneficiaries of identity politics. Uh, and then, so they're kind of hyper-privileged. And then there can be a kind of feedback where... Uh, so I, I don't think that's a very good way to understand British society and how British society works. But then there's a kind of feedback where you look at what's happened in... Uh, Israel and the Middle East, and you interpret it through that kind of model. Mm. So you say the Israelis are beneficiaries of white privilege, uh, black lives matter, but Palestinian lives also matter, so there's this kind of parallel between black lives and Palestinian lives, and you take a model of understanding society, which I think is a very poor model in relation to Britain or in relation to America, and you impose it on, to a completely different society, which yeah. is very, very complex, you know, the kind of Israel... Palestinian question. I would hope that one thing we can all agree on here, it is actually quite a complex uh, problem. And so you just look at it and it kind of confirms all your prejudices. Yes, the Israelis are the Jews, they're privileged, uh, the Palestinians are the kind of people of colour, they're unprivileged, and so you draw anti-Semitic conclusions. Or people here have quite rightly on the panel, they've referred to the 7th of October pogrom, where perhaps 2,000... Uh, <laughs> Hamas and other Palestinian Islamic Jihad fighters went into, or terrorists, went into Israel and slaughtered uh, 1,200 people, mainly Israelis, but in, also including, in fact, some foreign workers. Mm. Uh, and you just kind of blind yourself to that because you say, well, the, these people who were slaughtered are, are privileged people. The people who did it are the oppressed people, so it doesn't really matter. I don't really need to, to, to care about that. So just to conclude, I think that that, that's a really key factor. It's not the only factor. Islamism is a factor. There are other factors. But a key factor in explaining why anti-Semitism, overt anti-Semitism, has become more acceptable now than it was, say, five or ten years ago, is because of the rise of identity politics. Great. Thanks, Sonia. OK, uh, so I'd like to come straight out to the audience. We've got some volunteers who will run some microphones out. People can uh, disagree with the panellists. They can voice their own uh, difficulties of having understanding. We'll start with that gentleman there. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, I think um, that was a pretty good outline by the panel um, as a description of the thing. The, the last point, you see, I think it's a contradiction between what you said and what, I forget your name, Stephen. James. <laughs> no, Stephen. Stephen. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, yeah. Stephen. Yeah, and that is that um, with the identity, you've described the identity politics aspect of it. That applies to the left, right? The Western left or the British left. That's how they would see it. But the impetus behind all these demonstrations and everything like that is a combination of the left and Islamism, right? Islamism would be the driving force, I think, right? And, and, and you know, just to say that Isla, Isla, this is Islamic identity is part of it. It's just not. This is just a separate thing altogether, right? And who, in fact, are at odds with uh, identity politics in many respects, if you, if you think about it, in terms of the to women and so on and so on. Yep. I could okay. go on, right? This is massively different, different sets of people, right? One sees it as settler colonialism, and the other side sees it as something different, right? Islamic anti Semitism has got nothing to do with, with, with um, uh, the, the identity politics side of it. Nothing okay. whatsoever. It's scriptural. Great. And it gets back to what you said about um, what is the difference between Islamism and Islam? Just in answer to that, I, I, I think the, what Daniel was explaining is why there's a, um, a, 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 a psychological disconnect where people who uh, feel that they are helping oppressed people will excuse them of anything. So there's no, and just an interesting uh, observation, I went to the uh, Gaza March a couple of weeks ago, really to look at it, um, and just try and get a sense of who was there and what was really going on. And all of the, uh, in the town where I live, uh, I used to live in Wakefield, uh, coaches went down from Batley, Jewsbury, Keithley, but, you know, all, all around the north there were coaches um, mobilised from the mosques, and also local sort of uh, left-wing activists to take people down to London. My impression was that it was probably about 80% Muslim, the march. Lots and lots of young people. Um, but the most interesting conversation I had was with three young girls, uh, the same age as my daughter, sort of white middle class girls who might go to a music festival. And I said, what do you think of the 250 uh, girls and boys like yourself who were machine gunned in a, in a field um, after they were probably spent the night dancing on ease uh, at the peace festival? Uh, and I've seen the videos from inside the bunkers as Hamas were throwing the hand grenades uh, into, into because they were sheltering the bunkers because the rockets were coming up. What, what do you think of that? And without missing a beat, they said these, the, 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 these people are oppressed. That's why they did it. Now these girls are the same sorts of girls that could be at that festival. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they immediately excuse the behaviour. Mm -hmm. And I think what, what, uh, uh, what Daniel has done is really just uh, try, try to really explain how that takes place. Because you can see it on the BBC, you can see it in the news reports, there's a, there's a willingness to excuse the most repulsive barbarism. And I think if we can, perhaps in the discussion, try and unlock how we reach those girls and how we reach these people who are giving cover. Um, because my fear is that now we see a sort of uh, coalescence of sort of wokeness to use an awful phrase, and, and a very well motivated Islamism. Uh, you're seeing a power play in the Muslim community for the religious leaders over their own community. And you're seeing a coalescence of sort of wokeism giving cover to that. It's extremely okay. dangerous. So okay. just, the, just the last thing is that also tactically, people could be inspired by the moral certainty and the behavior and what they can do. And you know, left organisers, you know, whether you believe in climate change apocalypse or you believe this, that, and the other, you could see something quite dangerous coming about. Yeah, just a, um, briefly on the marches and those people who say that uh, they're going to express sympathy with the Palestinians and they've not got, uh, they're not anti-Semitic. Well, they give the anti-Semites a cloak of respectability, and I don't think it speaks very well of them that they couldn't be bothered to organize themselves, separate themselves off, 
set up a different organization and do a different march. If they can't even bother to do that basic level of separate organization to distinguish themselves from a, a bunch of out and out racists, then really I don't think that speaks very well of them. I think I just want to make a very quick point and ask the panel a question. We've heard the arguments around identity politics and siding with the oppressors and the problems that that represents. But the other words a number of the panel used was the notion of denial. And again, I just wanted to understand more about how we've got here. In, I heard a, overheard a conversation the other day amongst not such young people, but we can't know what's true. We can't know what's real. And I think this idea that we can't know what reality is, is something also that has led us here. When I've um, debated this, unfortunately, with university lecturers, the first thing they do is deny that, that October the 7th ever happened. Mm. And I think, despite the fact you can talk about identity politics, I mean, Andy was nearer to it when he talked about the unique barbarism of that moment. To me, it was absolutely barbaric. And the fact that Hamas leaders will say they'll do it again and again, and I've heard students saying do it again and again, the failure to recognise that, that we're facing something completely different. I do think Islamism and Islam are guilty as anybody as identity politics. They present themselves as the victims of the West. It's not a difficult issue. But to recognise that, that something terrible is about to happen and is happening, and I thought it would be true with the Manchester Arena bombings, but people are playing it down. And I think the rise in anti-Semitism is a really serious aspect of um, what happened then. But what is worse is the sheer denial of the barbarism that was unveiled at that moment, and I think other people will face it. As the United Emirates have said, lots of people have said, you're facing something more terrible, and I think that's true. And um, I, I still haven't got the answer to it. I, I always interpret it as a form of identity politics with victim culture. You know, the, the Palestinians are always at the bottom of every victim hierarchy. They're the ultimate victims. But saying that doesn't help, you know, because I think something else is happening. And it's unique. OK, thanks. Uh, let's uh, grab some responses from the panel. Uh, Stephen, I'll start with you. Yeah, um, I just want to pick up on those uh, eloquent points Daniel made on, on identity, pol identity politics and that ferocious disagreement he had with me about um, <laughs> Islamism. Uh, so just to clear things up, I, I wasn't suggesting that Islamism is the only place you'll find anti-Semitism or the source of anti-Semitism. I'm saying in sort of 2023, it's the place you'll find anti-Semitism with the least effort. Um, this just seems to be true. And Islamism itself, when I use that word, I mean sort of political Islam. The desire to impose this on other people, the desire to live like this, which to me is a very obnoxious form of identity politics uh, in its own right. So uh, I, think, I think we're on the same page. I think we're friends again. <laughs> um, but um, this, this idea of, uh, this idea of, you know, this, I think, is it Bertrand Russell who, who described it as the superior virtue of the oppressed? the idea that perhaps because somebody's oppressed, they're automatically virtuous. And I, I mean, I'm seeing a lot of kind of like queers for Palestine and, and Jews for Palestine and, and things like that. I don't think they quite realize how quickly they'd be launched off a rooftop if they tried to sort of express themselves in that society. So I just think we need to be very careful uh, about this and we need to be very honest about what the motivating ideologies are. Great, thanks. Uh, listen. Okay. So thank you. So um, I think not many people in the audience have mentioned anti-Semitism. I think denial of what happened, at the root of that is the idea that we can't trust Jews to be straight with us, we can't trust them to tell the truth, they're always up to something. Um, and we've seen uh, claims that October the 7th was an inside job uh, to um, you know, justify as a pretext to attack Gaza. Um, we've, we've not just seen it amongst young people and students, but we've even seen it with the BBC journalists, people like Jeremy Bowen, who, um, when he was reporting on the uh, murders at one of the kibbutzim in southern Israel, uh, and referred to the fact that um, the IDF, who were clearing, clearing the place, had seen uh, a beheaded baby, you know, he made the point, well, you know, the BBC hasn't seen it, but we're told by the IDF that there's a, there's a beheaded baby. But when Hamas comes out with claims that it was Israel that hit a, you know, hospital, when in fact it was a, a rocket fired by Palestinian Islamic Jihad, or when Hamas claims there are 
20,000 people dead, including, you know, 75% of women and children. Um, that, that they don't query. Um, and the justification point as well is uh, the Jews had it coming to them. And this, this again, is an old anti-Semitic trope, that the Jews get what they deserve. Um, so, and I think these, these ideas and the ideas of it, the, Israel as a settler colony that needs to be dismantled and the acts of terrorism are acts of resistance uh, is very, very strong on the hard left. And we've got academia to thank for that because the whole idea of Israel as a settler colonial state has been pushed and pushed and pushed uh, in academia. And although people who come out on these marches may not be consciously anti-Semitic, um, you've got to ask yourself why um, the people, you know, these people only care about Palestine. They don't come out on the streets for any other international conflict. They don't complain about Palestinians being killed in Syria or anywhere else. Um, so I'll leave it there. Yeah, great. There's plenty more to go back to, but Daniel. Yeah, I mean, part of the problem of the discussion of Islamism is that very few people understand what Islamism is, in my view. They just think it's an extreme form of the Islamic religion, which I think is completely wrong. I, I would say Islamism is a religionized form of politics. So it was a, a political movement that emerged first in Egypt in 1928 with the foundation of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, as a kind of political movement, an anti-modern political movement that incorporated a lot of assumptions from the West, including the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which is a notorious Tsarist forgery, uh, anti-Semitic forgery, but was incorporated, among other things, into Islamist thought. And if you look at the assumptions of Islamism, I mean, yes, they're, they're anti-gay and anti-women, uh, but they're also, they're against the nation state, they're anti-democratic, they're against modernity, uh, they're completely hostile to any kind of criticism. In fact, they share an awful lot with identity politics. Mm. So this idea that there's this vast gulf between Islamism and identity politics is completely wrong. There's an awful lot in common between identity politics. So it's not the left, it's identity politics and Islamism. They have an awful lot in common. And the importance of Islam in this discussion uh, in Britain is that it gives, I think Guy had it right at the front, it gives kind of permission for these kind of white identitarians to be anti-Semitic. Because they think, well, in their, in their mind, if the Muslims are being anti-Semitic, then it's okay for us, the kind of white identitarians, to be anti-Semitic. Because the oppressed people are making anti-Semitic comments. This is their kind of assumption. Therefore, we, the Western identitarians, the white identitarians, it's also okay for us to do it. So I think that that is a key factor why uh, overt anti-Semitism is now becoming respectable, again, in certain sections of British society. Thanks, Daniel. I yeah, um, I'd like to kind of um, endorse a lot of what's um, just been said. Um, I, I think that the question you raised about the apparent differences between um, identity politics and Islam Islamism it, it is a valid point. There are lots of striking contradictions between what you think both groups would um, believe in. But I think the way we overcome that is by, and I don't mean to be flippant here, we have to understand that identity politics is very, very stupid. It is not an intellectual high point. It's ridiculous to think that because the color of my skin is going to determine what's in my mind. But that's what they think. So we've got to understand it's intellectually redundant. It's silly. When you, when you have stupidity, it makes it easier to make these, kind of, these kinds of um, um, coalitions, if you like, between opposing forces. And when you also have an ideology that's overwhelmingly, as we've talked about, based on victimhood and oppression, when that becomes the overall, the kind of alpha ambition of it, then it becomes easier to ignore some of the other contradictions if you fit in people who would potentially oppose you, such as far-right Islamists, into your uh, oppression odometer, whereby um, um, Asians possibly are just one rung up from black people in terms of being perpetual victims. So I think that's the way in which they kind of um, marry the, fun the, the differences between the two ideologies. Um, the second point somebody raised about marches, um, I think it's a valid point. Um, I wouldn't go as far as the former Home Secretary to say they all hate marches, um, because obviously, as we've said, that there will be some people there who aren't consumed with hate for Jews. 
But look, we've had weeks and weeks of this now. You would know if you went on those marches now that there is a significant contingent that is anti-Semitic. If I went on a march one week and I saw lots and lots of Ku Klux Klan members or National Front members or BMP members, fair enough, I'd be disappointed. I tell you what I wouldn't do, I wouldn't go the next week. I wouldn't go the week after that and I wouldn't go again and again and again. So I think there is a degree of complicity by this point in terms of saying that, oh, some people are just there for good reasons, they're just misguided. They may well be, but they've had long enough to know what's going on at these marches. And I think that as someone's just maybe set up an alternative kind of march or demonstration, but you cannot just say, oh, those other people in the march I'm attending are nothing to do with me. You're complicit by your association with them. Yeah. And, and just, just, re just, yeah, quick, quick one, just, quick yeah, just very quickly, the denial point someone mentioned, I think Andy mentioned it, and it was mentioned here as well. I think that's really important, and we're not going to get over this until those three young girls who Andy mentioned don't answer, um, that they don't justify the horror we saw on October 7th by saying, oh, they're oppressed. They have been hypnotized by a narrative. The way we get over it is by giving them another narrative, a positive narrative, a better narrative about integration, and a narrative where you don't define and interpret and understand everybody purely through their physical appearance or whatever social or religious or racial group they come to. So we need to build a different story to convince those three girls that um, oppression's not enough to justify barbarism. Well, we're hearing quite a bit distinguishing Islamism from Islam, particularly with respect to anti-Semitism. And my understanding, Islamism is very much a product of modernity. It has its roots in Wahhabism in the 19th century and in organizations like the Muslim Brotherhood in, in the 20th. Um, well, one question is whether we need another term, because the two terms are simply too close to each other. Um, but I wonder, I mean, I've been looking at polls which show that the amount of, in, in the West, or certainly in Britain, the amount of really radicalized sentiments amongst the British Muslim community are very much a small minority. And actually, the major sentiment might be quite mainstream and even quite conservative in some ways on many issues. And I wonder if the issue is that some people on the radical left lionizing only the radicalized people as somehow representing some authentic view and how we can combat that. Um, I, I do think um, the, um, the presence of large Muslim communities, immigration, um, Islamism even is a red herring um, in this discussion. It really is a red herring. I don't know if people have watched, there's a, the, the clips available on Twitter, a very senior Sky News Reporter Ayala Hakim uh, interviewing Mark Regev, uh, former Israel, former ambassador to UK and advisor to Netanyahu, um, and she's talking about the hostage um, exp uh, exchange. Um, and she describes the Palestinians that were released as hostages, children, she described them as these are teenagers who were convicted for uh, stabbing for, for, for a murderous attack. So she was comparing them as an equivalent to a two year old. Um, an Israeli toddler who was handed back as part of that exchange. And Mark Regoff, with great composure, really pushes back a matter, but she will not budge. She will not budge on this. Now, Sky News, I can reveal, is not an Islamist um, <laughs> organization. Um, Sky News has very little truck um, with Islam, uh, with Christianity for that matter, um, or Islamism. What we're seeing there in that equivalent she made between uh, Palestinian detainees who carried out criminal, uh, quite serious criminal attacks and a two-year-old toddler, I think a four-year-old and a nine-year-old were released um, as well. That equivalence, that silence and that stubbornness, that mulishness to even back down when Regev made a very powerful argument against it goes much, much deeper. That might mean there is then a silence um, in terms of the marches and in terms of some of the what goes on on those marches, but the problem is much higher up first. I mean, if Sky News, one of the most senior television presenters on Sky News, thinks that there is a moral equivalence between a teenage Palestinian youth who's in jail for stabbing people and a two year old Israeli toddler, that shows you how deep this problem comes. It's got nothing to do with Islam. Hi, yeah, so I wanted to get, I've got two points, but I'll see if I can cover the first point fairly quickly. And I just noticed I was kind of thrown back by how quickly people chose sides. 
and how quickly they chose sides based on whether they were left-wingers or right-wingers. It was really astounding to me that people that I knew were sort of left-leaning immediately jumped on the wagon of Palestine. And people that were more right-wing immediately jumped on the wagon of supporting Israel. And what I noticed both sides were doing was they brought valid criticism of the other side, but they downplayed some of the issues that or some of the atrocities that their side might have done, right? So people that supported Palestine would downplay Hamas, would downplay like, oh, Hamas doesn't really portray Palestinians, blah, blah, blah. And the other side would do the same. They would barely mention like the open air prison that Gaza technically is and the, the heavy boot that Israel has put down on Palestine, <laughs> which, is, which, is, which is valid enough, but you still, you can say that, and you can say at the same time that Palestine is ruled, ruled by a terror organization. And I don't understand why there's so few people that are willing to look at both sides and see, okay, it's really hard to support either side, because there's a lot of evil and past atrocity on both sides. And I think I'll just cover that, that main point there and finish it up by saying that I see a risk not only of anti-Semitism increasing here, but also Islamophobia at the same time. So both Jews and Muslims could become targets of more antagonism, it seems to me. Especially if you start suggesting that it's sort of inbuilt in the scripture of the Quran that, you know, uh, that, that they should persecute and hunt down Jews, right? I haven't read the Quran, I haven't read the Bible as of yet, so I'd like to see that for myself, whether it is the case. But I'm sure a lot of Muslims would disagree that they're not necessarily attacking or hunting down Jews and it's not in their scripture or that's not how they see their scripture. I could imagine that. Okay. At least. Thank you for the analysis um, of the situation. Um, what I would like to ask of either the audience or the panel is what can we do to help Jewish people in this country be able to leave their houses and feel the same freedom that they felt a few weeks ago? What can we do apart from supporting individuals? I fear I might be a minority of one. It's obvious that Israel is a, is a settler state. And you cannot say that the people who apparently are anti-Semitic on these, on these marches are ignorant of the background. Let us consider just two things. The murders of Palestinian, Palestinians in the West Bank, uninvestigated murder, very similar to what the American whites did to the Californian Indians in the 19th century. And let me, me, me just talk about Deir Yassin Remembered. Does anybody know what Deir Yassin Remembered is? It's a group that are supported by Jews in, 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 in Israel about a, about a Palestinian village that was obliterated by the settlers in 1948, along with many others, absolutely flattened. There are so many crimes being committed by Israeli Jews since 1948, they're uncountable. Yeah, I think, I think there's, I don't know if naivety, naivety is the right word, but to this gentleman, Islam mm. is, in, they, they teach Jew hatred. Islam is, to, to deny it, now I'm not saying all Muslims agree, buy into it, but that's what they teach. And I say to my, my British friends, my, not, uh, my white and black British friends, I say, because they tell me they don't like Muslims, but they also don't trust Jews. They, can, they say they can have each other. And what I say to them, I say, okay, fine. You let the Muslims kill all the Jews. Do you think they're gonna be happy? Gonna, we're done here. No, they won't. They're going to come after gay people, they're going to come after women, they're going to come after Christians, they're going to come after everybody else. And by the, by the time they get to you, there will be nobody left to save your sorry, scared ass. <laughs> and, that's, and that's how it is. All right, thanks. All right, leave it for, okay, we're going to take you, we're then going to take the panel, then I see we've got more hands, so we'll come back out. Yep. Hello, um, I'd like to disagree with this gentleman here. I think it's a very Western idea to make this distinction between Islam and Islamism. Um, Muslims themselves don't make this distinction. They, if you talk to Muslims, they say it's a way of life, it's not just a religion. 
it's a system of jurisprudence and politics that don't make this big distinction between policy. That's why they're against democracy. So, you know, it's, it's just still informed that. And it is in the Quran and the Hadiths to hate Jews. They okay. are a cursed people. And the next group are the Christians who are misguided. But it's there in the prayers. So it's denial not to see that. All right, thanks. All right, let's start um, with Ike this time. So a couple of quick responses. OK. Um, I disagree with the premise. I can't remember who mentioned it here, that this has nothing to do with Islam or Islamism. Um, I can say that I can say that I, I'm not I'm not being Islamophobic. Um, I, I, I don't I'm not offended by Islam as a religion. But as I said earlier, it's it's ridiculous to ignore the gentleman just mentioned. There are elements within Scripture that condemn Jews, and there are specific elements and problems within parts of Muslim culture that also condemn Jews and Judaism as well. To recognize that is not to be racist or to be against Islam as a whole. It's just an observation of reality, and we have to make real-time observations if we're going to cure problems. Yes, there are other reasons as well. I think identity politics is a big reason, um, the Western guilt, etc., why the Sky News um, presenter refused to um, go along with Mark Rejev's um, very worthy intervention that a two-year-old toddler is completely different from a 14-year-old who's tried to stab somebody. Um, there are many different ingredients that go into a cake, but I think Islamism is one of them. And to kind of ignore it or to say it's not really a part of the problem doesn't get us any closer to solving it. Okay, let's leave it there because we have to get out for some more hands. Daniel. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm probably halfway between Stephen and Bruno on, on this question. I mean, I think Bruno did maybe for effect kind of overstate the argument. Uh, I should make it clear I don't think Sky News is an Islamist organisation. <laughs> I didn't accuse them of being uh, Islamist. But I think Islamism is a secondary factor. So I'm not arguing it's a primary factor. It's a secondary factor in this whole thing. So if you look, for example, Friends of Al-Aqsa, which is an Islamist organization, is involved in organizing these marches. The Muslim Council of Great, of Great Britain, which is mm. an Islamist organization, is involved in these things. So it does have some involvement. But I see it much more as a kind of catalyst. And the primary factor is this kind of woke identity politics yep. factor. That's a key thing. Just on the question also of Islam versus Islamism, you have philo-Semitic, pro-Jewish passages in the Quran and anti-Semitic passages. You have awful passages in the Bible in relation to non-Jews. But the question really is, why do people interpret Islamic texts in a certain way today, or certain people uh, interpret them in a certain way? And the Islamists have a particular take on it. And you can only explain that in relation to uh, what's happening today, contemporary developments, rather than what happened 1,600 years ago. Mm -hmm. But just to reiterate, the key thing, though, for the vast majority of the British public, uh, in terms of an influence on them, not that they will accept it, is this identity politics question. Right. And just very quickly on what we can do, uh, in a couple of sentences, there's a march tomorrow uh, supporting, uh, opposing anti-Semitism and supporting Israel's right to exist, a march tomorrow, which I would recommend everyone who can go on it. And also some friends of mine have set up a campaign called Our Fight. Our Fight UK is the website, uh, which is trying to get mainly non-Jewish people to support Jews in the fight against anti-Semitism. Because mm -hmm. there are organisations which are primarily oriented towards Jewish people, which is fine, but this is primarily oriented towards getting solidarity for Jewish people against anti-Semitism. Okay. So getting involved in Our Fight is a very good thing. Okay, thanks. Uh, Leslie? Um, right, so uh, I think to speak to respond to the gentleman over there, I think the Israel-Palestine conflict, which is very complicated, is a very polarised debate, and I think that's why people took sides very quickly. Um, I'm not. I, I mean, I understand there has been a slight rise in Islamophobia. I don't know what the um, you know extent of it is in terms of anti-Semitism. The Community Security Trust has reported that there's been a tenfold increase in anti-Semitic hate crime uh, since October the 7th. And not only have did Jewish schools close uh, on one or two days, but also many synagogues around the country have a police officer outside with a gun every Saturday morning uh, when Jews go to worship. Um, and I'm from Sheffield, and I know the, the local synagogue in Sheffield had an armed police officer 
uh, for several weeks uh, and probably still does as well. In terms of what you can do to help Jewish people, I think, as Daniel said, there's a march tomorrow, starts at 1.30 outside the courts, uh, law courts on the Strand. I'm going down by train to join it. And I think if you know any Jewish people, just reach out to them and ask them if they're all right. They are feeling very isolated and alone and very abandoned. Um, the October the 7th was sent huge shockwaves, not only around Israel, um, but around the whole Jewish world because the more people were murdered, more Jews were murdered in, in one day uh, than, as, uh, than ever since okay. the Holocaust. Uh, and they are feeling very abandoned. And can I just say... Well, save it for um, the wrap-up, save it for the wrap-up, because yeah, I want to okay. get a couple more questions. Yeah, right. Stephen, one quick point. Yeah, just to hammer this issue of Islamism further into the ground. Uh, I, I accept it is a form of identity politics, but I think it vastly misses the point to claim it is just a version of identity politics. Culture produces identity politics all the time. This changes like the wind. The problem we have with Islam or Islamism, whatever makes you feel more comfortable, is that it's scripturally ordained. And this is to Islamists the word of God, or the final word of God, if you believe in it. So good luck changing that. And to this idea that you know there is equally anti-Semitic passages in the Bible, I, I firmly agree that's the correct. But you'd be very hard pressed to find a single Church of England wishy-washy Christian which would uphold them beliefs mm -hmm. in the common day. So okay. I think that's the distinction we have to. Approach. Okay, then I'm not going to be able to take you all because I've kind of run out of time. As regards the Bible, which is first of all, there's a trope that. The Bible was written, every word of it was written by a Jew. So the Christian, Jesus was a Jew, the apostles were Jews. So it's a bit of a trope that the Bible is, it says all these things. It, it reflects a, an opinion. Well, can I just say, it's worth, I don't know if that guy's still here, it's worth reading the Quran. It's only very short. And with textual analysis, um, in the Bible, the most common phrase and it's something about 750 times, for those of you who know his scripture, is be not afraid. Textual analysis of the Quran, the uh, most common phrase is strike them in the neck, right? So there is a very big difference. And last year, 5,634 Christians were killed, 95% of which, well, a few were killed in China, and. Uh, okay, okay. But, but the, most of them were killed by people of the Islamic faith. Not many of them would call themselves Islamists. They would call themselves followers of Islam. Um, I, uh, <coughs> difficult conversations are good to speak, see people having this difficult conversation. Um, I just wanted to come back on, on the gentleman at the front saying that uh, Israel has done all these terrible things. They have done terrible things, probably. I'm not an expert on the area. But they have. I can't say that because I'm not an expert and I don't know. Okay, then just get your point. They also have uh, tried to bridge the, 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 an olive branch to Gaza over, over the years and tried to uh, make peace with these people. So I, I think that's just a one-sided way of looking at it. We can all cherry pick our <coughs> Probably extremely naive of me, um, but I can't see this situation being resolved. We're sort of like invited to two sides and I find it extremely difficult. Um, the naive part of me, uh, I mean like Muslims, Christians, Jews, or whatever, all claim some historical uh, claims on, on the land of Palestine, uh, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, my solution, naive as it is, would be to drop all the borders. People can choose where they want to go. Obviously, you can't just do it unilaterally overnight, but some sort of campaign to do that. I find the term anti-Semitic really problematical, just like I find all of these terms transphobic, um, homophobic and so on, they're thrown out as slurs. This is not to say that I don't believe that anti-Semitism is an actual real phenomenon. It is. But the effect of just throwing out the label all the time means that people like me, who are horrified by what is happening in Gaza at the moment, I'm neither an Islamist or an anti-Semite or an identity person. I'm horrified at a human level at what I see as a completely disproportionate response by Israel. And it's very difficult to talk about that. Okay, stop. It's stop. Let us speak. Right. It's very difficult to talk about this. 
as an ex it's just a, an example has just happened, without the label anti-Semite being thrown at one for actually wanting to talk in any complex way about the situation. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, I wouldn't normally stand up in something like this, but um, yeah, I'm quite cross. I have to uh, declare a bias. I am wholly, utterly, and totally pro-Jew, pro-Jewish. Okay, your Easy. point. So there's a reason for it. The reason is simply this. The first time I visited Bergen Belsen concentration camp, I was six years old. And it was maybe only 27 years after the war, and it was fresh, and it was raw, and it was horrific. And if you want the younger people to understand and not to be able to deny, then show them that truth. If you show people the truth of what happened only just outside of our own lifetimes, then they would hopefully start to think about things. Okay, nice. Um, I, I actually think it's complicated for the panel because certainly people in my generation, the only thing we learned in history was about the Holocaust mm. and the Second World War, and yet at the same time, uh, anti-Semitism seems to have kind of revived itself. So I think it's an interesting question. Right, there's that person there. Pass the microphone, someone's pointing at someone over there. Go. Yeah. Uh, just very quickly, and the, the lady in the front, I think, makes a very good point about the fact that this is a nuanced conversation and throwing labels around doesn't really help. And in some ways, we've opened up a bit of a hornet's nest in, in some of the audience where it's very e easy to flip this round, whereas those outside who are anti-Semites, we can now feel legitimate in being anti-Muslim uh, in, in, you know, in, in these four walls. And we just have to be very careful and very cautious about the labels that we throw. And the second thing to say is that my, you know, these thing, this thing splits families. My brother, who's not you know, completely against identity politics, understands what's been going on in modern politics and been on side, has split the family down the middle because he's gone pro-Palestine and become an apologist for what's gone on in, uh, in Gaza and the terrors that have happened, precisely because, like this gentleman, he remembers the terrible things that Israel did historically and in some respects still continue, continues to do. I think we can still have a rational conversation which says that this was a pogrom, that this was a horrendous <coughs> attack by Hamas uh, terrorist militants and realize that you know Israel is not a, a saintly organization. But the biggest problem is that this was not a replay of some intifada. This was not Palestinian liberation expressing itself against the Israeli state. This was just a mere, pure act of terrorism. And on that level, I think we can have no uh, truck okay. with what Hamas has been organizing. Great. Uh, in the first session this morning, I heard a lady say something which has been echoing it constantly in this session, which is uh, everybody here believes in communication. These people don't. And as she said this morning, this isn't about communication. This is about labeling and pillorying people and ostracizing them. The people who understand we've reached that stage are the IDF. And when you've reached that stage, you fight. And that's what they're doing. Okay, I just wanted to respond to what the gentleman said over there. I think that with youngsters, we've kind of intellectualized and empathized certain corners, whatever it is, so much that if you show them what is true, it will be very hard to get them to take it in and believe it because we're just in this, this space of brainwashing. I'm currently studying a fine art course right now and what is going off in the concrete real world is really reflecting this ambiguous art world to me. And I wonder what the threads are coming from that or who has come from that space and gone, let's make this be this. That doesn't mean that, because it just feels like I'm in this weird art experiment. I just <laughs> I don't know what's going on. And what I would actually like to okay. say is, it would be great to have someone from a psychological point of view in how these ideas are affecting our children and each other okay. in spaces. Great, thanks. Okay, thanks for that point. Now, I'm gonna ask you or don't clap these final summations, otherwise you really will be late. But. Uh, but Stephen, we'll kick off you. Just a final minute to capture something. Yeah, very quickly. I just want to thank this gentleman down here for his very optimistic uh, point about taking down borders. I, I wish that's what we could do, and I wish we all, I think we all uh, feel that way. Uh, but I think we have to be realistic. The, the only thing keeping Jews alive in that region right now are the borders, unfortunately. Uh, with the Jews were numerous in the surrounding states for many years, and they've since been ethnically 
cleanse. So I think, you know, it's not really about taking sides per se, it's about taking the side of the reality of the situation. Oh, uh, that, was a, that was a model of brevity. Thanks so much, Stephen. Right, um, Mike. Um, I'd just like to conclude that I, I'm not a Jew, I'm not Jewish, but I grew up in a part of London where my childhood was dipped into many cultures, um, Jewish, Muslim, um, Bangladeshi, and I think the way we overcome this, we have a mayor of London who constantly, you just wind him up and he says diversity is our strength. He says it all the time. Um, I grew up at a time when unity was our strength. And I think the way in which we stop um, ancient or foreign rivalries coming here is by believing in ourselves as a community once again. Okay, so. thanks so much. I, uh, let's see. Well, I'm not, I'm not really sure what to say to some of actually. This uh, has been, I don't know, is this one word? No, yeah, you go yeah. to that one. Oh, to that it. one, okay. Yeah, there's been so many points made. Um, maybe I'll just say a few words about anti Semitism today as we've seen it in, uh, since October the 7th. Um, so it appears that a huge number of people care only about Palestine and no other international cause. And they're happy, you know, to turn up at these marches and go along with a chant uh, from the river to the sea, Israel will be free, that supports, is, uh, sorry, from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, that supports um, the destruction of Israel. Uh, but they think they're supporting human rights. Um, and, and I think, you know, we have to remember that Hamas um, did, uh, what they did on October the 7th was, was committed genocidal violence, and they would have done more um, had they got away with it. And, and part of their charter, their charter states that they want to um, kill, kill all Jews, basically. And that is the aim. It's eliminationist. And I think we have to bear that in mind. And just to say that when people talk about proportionality, that is their military term. We're not talking about equal numbers of no. people dead on each side no. or equal uh, in firepower. That's not what we're referring to. Israel's war aims are to destroy Hamas's military and operational capabilities. No. Hamas no. hides no. Under, civilian, under civilian structures. So Israel has got every right, every lawful, legitimate right to exercise self-defense. And you have, to, you have to be very skeptical about the numbers of dead that are being, that are being uh, come out of the Gaza Ministry of Health because it's run by Hamas. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, okay no, there, there, there'll be plenty more um, to get to, but we'll finish with that. Okay, well, what's the difference between criticism of Israel and criticism of Israel which kind of moves towards anti-Semitism? I think it's very straightforward. If you judge Israel by the normal criteria of any nation state, that's fine. So if you judge it according to the same criteria you would judge Britain or Chile or Germany or whatever, you can see strengths and weaknesses, and, and that's fine. I don't have any problem with people doing that. If you see Israel as the epitome of evil, and what a lot of these phrases are really about, they're not scientific phrases like settler colonialism, apartheid, imperialism, racism. If you see Israel as the epitome of evil, that is anti-Semitism. If you say there's no counter-narrative, it's all obvious. All this, you know, 75 plus years of history is all very straightforward. There's no kind of counter narrative. It's all obvious that is anti Semitism. So we need to be very clear about the distinction. Anything which sees Israel not as a normal state, nation state, but the epitome of evil, that is a form of anti Semitism. Okay, can we thank the panel?